Welcome to Forbidden Planet TV, uh, where, where I'm privileged to be joined today by Tanana Reeve Dew, who is the multi-award multi winning author who teaches uh, black horror and Afrofuturism at UCLA. Uh, Ms. Dew has won an American Book Award, an NACP Image Award, a British Fantasy Award, and her books include uh, Ghost Summer Stories, My Soul to Keep and The Good House. And um, that's an indelible memoir that uh, Tanon Reeve uh, um, uh, wrote with her mother, the activist Patricia Stevens Jew, Freedom in the Family, a mother-daughter memoir of the fight for civil rights. And not only that, but she also co-authored that excellent season two episode of uh, Jordan Peele's Twilight Zone, A Small Town. Welcome Tanon Reeve, how are you? I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for having me on. Hey, th thanks for joining us. And uh, it, to talk especially about a product that's uh, very a book that's very close to our heart. So my colleagues at Titan Books are just about to publish Black Panther, Tales of Wakanda, uh, an anthology title edited by the great Jesse J. Holland, and uh, for which uh, Tanana Reeve has contributed a, a very special story. So, so that short story is, in fact, um, Return of the Queen. Am I right, Tanon Reeve? Yes, yes. So, so before you tell me about that, could you, um, could you talk a bit about when you first discovered uh, Black Panther, when you first discovered T'Challa? When did you first become aware of him? You know, I have to admit, I have not been much of a comics reader. So like a lot of Black Panther fans, I came to Black Panther through the MCU, you know, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, became a fan of that going back to, you know, the Iron Man uh, movies. And then of course, Black Panther's first appearance in Captain America Civil War was is an event in my life, you know, uh, move or you will be moved, you know, as I have said, it's like, ah, and just seeing glimpses of T'Challa with a great introduction of T'Challa. But then of course the Ryan Coogler's Black Panther was an entire sort of cultural spectacle, not just in the United States, but around the world where so many black people, no matter where you were from, just felt so seen and strong and powerful. Yeah, right on. I mean, such an amazing, indelible piece of work actually. And uh, for something, I think, to be so culturally resonant and to, you know, to celebrate the culture of Africa in the way that it does and uh, celebrate uh, the Wakandan people in the way that it does. And that really leads on to what I was going to ask you is what do T'Challa and, and what do Wakanda represent to you? That is a great question. And the first word that pops into my mind is power. You know, as an African American who is a descendant, you know, of American slavery, there's this sort of hole in your history. Uh, what was my language of my lineage? You know, what were the mythologies of my lineage? Where did my great, 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 great grandparents come from? And what were their lives like? You know, I was really, I came of age after Alex Haley published his novel Roots which was really a great glimpse into what life was like in the continent before. In fact, I stopped reading when Kunta Kinte got his foot chopped off because, uh, right. okay. yeah. <laughs> because I was just, that piece really stands out just sort yeah. of, and, and it's fiction as well, but just yeah. the idea of what might have been before is very powerful. And then when you take Wakanda, which never had any colonization, which has lived in secrecy, yeah. which has both the technologies that are futuristic and the rituals and traditions that honor history, that actually is kind of what Afrofuturism is. You know, the black speculative arts, especially African-American speculative arts that kind of live somewhere between the past, present and the future. Yeah, I, and that, that's, that's, that is a very interesting answer. And you touched upon something that uh, fascinated me. I, I mean, I don't know if this is apocryphal or not. I don't think it is. It's the story that I, I imagine you've heard as well about the fact that originally the producers of the movie, maybe even Ryan Coogler himself, were thinking that um, Chadwick Boseman might play uh, T'Challa with like a, an English accent as if it'd been away to Oxford or something. And he right. and he chose and he chose and he said no no you know Wakanda's never been colonized he's got to speak with an African accent which I think was actually turned out to be such a powerful choice for the movie. I absolutely agree that would have been a mistake 
and 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 giving too much importance to I mean, he may well have studied overseas you know people study from overseas everywhere but that doesn't mean that he would have come home <laughs> with another accent and i think that's a great choice yeah i i i i couldn't agree i couldn't agree more so um what can you tell me about about your story in this collection return of the queen well, I had to get permission, you know, from the great S editor, Jesse J. Holland, because, you know, sometimes these things are kept under wraps. And I was so excited to have an opportunity to write this story. It's called Return of the Queen. And people who are familiar with the Black Panther canon will know that T'Challa was once married to a woman named Aurora, but we know her as Storm. And as someone, like I said, who is a fan of the MCU, it was always kind of frustrating that Storm was in a different franchise and the yeah. two, I, they have appeared together, I understand, in, in the comics. That's correct, since, yeah. Since he annulled the marriage. But I didn't really know much, like I said, I didn't come from the comics universe. I didn't really know much about that. So for me as a cinema fan, especially, it was like, ah, oh, it's that reunion we're always talking about on Twitter. It's that reunion we've all dreamed of, like what would it be like and, and what circumstances would bring them back together? Yeah, what a lovely thing to explore. Um, without, uh, can you give me any more of a flavor of the story? Or so I'll give you a little bit of a hint. I was told not to give away the ending. So yeah. let's just say um, T'Challa himself was too proud to think of even calling her. So it will come as a surprise to no one that it's actually Shuri who uh, who calls Aurora uh, because there's a, a problem brewing on Wakanda's borders that isn't affecting them directly yet, but seems mysterious enough and powerful enough that she's thinking, you know, let's bring a goddess into this because that's what Storm basically is. She that is what she is, like yeah, for sure. Power, yeah. she can control weather. I'm sorry, that to me <laughs> is what makes you a goddess, being able to control weather patterns um, and flight. And I'm really jealous that she can fly. So of course I had to have a long <laughs> section in the story where she's just flying and I could live vicariously through her. Yeah, oh, that, 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 that's, that's, that's wonderful. And one of the great gifts, of course, of being an author, a storyteller like yourself, uh, it, it, it's that, that ability to dive deep into your imagination and put yourself it, it, you know, in the place of of this great goddess flying around. You know, I, I think I think that's that's a tremendous upside of being an author like yourself. I think. And and on that note, actually, um, what inspirations would you say you had putting this short story together? What is it that you really wanted to to say about this fascinating world of Wakanda about about its inhabitants? Well, the thing is, you know, the Black Panther universe is huge. It's huge, not just the, in terms of the movies, but I did, you know, for my Afrofuturism class, I read the Christopher Priest Black Panther, the Reginald Headland Black Panther, and that adaptation. There's so much you can choose from this huge tableau. And I wanted to winnow it down to a love story, right? Because that's the one thing T'Challa doesn't white have is uh, a mate you know who can be the mate for someone as powerful as T'Challa and of course Lupita's character was kind of teased as a love interest in the film but all the comic readers know that his true love was Aurora because for uh, a prince a king of that caliber he can only walk side by side with the goddess and we all know they're supposed to be together now <laughs> I will say there are, you know, you can't just rewrite all kind of Marvel history and do what you want when you work on one of these projects. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I'm really, really grateful because when I, I wasn't even sure I would have time to write a story for this anthology to be to be completely candid. And Jesse was so supportive. And I was like, well, would I be allowed to reunite Storm and T'Challa? And he was like, yes. So that was really the thing that sold me on it. Um, and he was very helpful in kind of coaching me on like, okay, various supervillains I might want to use because again, I'm not <laughs> as well versed. I had just come off of a cereal box, Black Panther project, Sins of the King, which made it even possible because I had already done a lot of research. I had already been kind of working in that universe, but I have to say one of my inspirations was from my own previous work. I wrote a, a novel called My Soul to Keep that was part of a series about an Ethiopian immortal. And it was really sort of drawing on that history, those characters that are so larger than life and what it's like when they're together and how they might feel when they're in each other's presence was tremendously helpful. 
and crafting this story on a, on a pretty short deadline, actually. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that is so interesting. And of course, Jesse is, uh, you know, the great, um, the great uh, standard bearer for Black Panther, the great enthusiast. And so- uh, He it, just knows it all. You can ask he, him anything. He certainly does. He, he tells you right off the top of his head. He actually <laughs> does. And he'll give it to you full bore. 10 to the dozen you know he's never lost for a word or two it's yeah. beautiful it's, it's lovely hearing him talk about about the about this great fictional world tonight Reeve, can you remember the circumstances in which you saw the black panther movie for the first time uh yeah <laughs> i mean uh actually well we all dressed up so these earrings are our south african earrings that i bought from a, a local store in los angeles and while i was there shopping i ran into people i knew you know because everybody was there shopping and it was a big family production and i'm almost positive the first time i saw it we went to a theater in baldwin hills uh that we thought would be a mostly black theater oh my gosh i'm forgetting the main thing anthony bresnikan a reporter invited me to the premiere. Oh my gosh, how could I? Okay, so, <laughs> okay if, if I really think hard, I can remember that I was at the Black Panther premiere. I literally Amazing. saw Stan Lee wheeled into the, his place in the audience in the front row. All the actors were on the stage and you're there with the royalty of Hollywood watching this movie unfold and the whole time I could just think, oh, I wish my husband Stephen Barnes were here to see this with me because he he's a huge Black Panther fan. And, you know, it, it's a real testament to the the strength of our marriage that he let me go off to the premiere with somebody else. Absolutely. It really <laughs> Not because is. of jealousy, no, because yeah. he didn't get to see it. Of course, I know I get that. <laughs> so you got to have two amazing events. You got to go to the premiere and to be there with the the cast and with Stan and the creators. And then you also got to have your big family celebration. Right, where we uh, all went together so and dressed brilliant. up in Baldwin yeah. Hills. And I saw it obviously like many people several times and it almost seems like um, a lost era. There was so much enthusiasm and joy. Um, and of course, with the passing of Chadwick Boseman, sometimes now we look back on some of those photographs of people celebrating with, with a sense of sadness. And on that note, I would like to say that I had pretty much just finished this story. Like, I think I had just turned it in maybe two days prior, even maybe the day prior, when I heard about the death of Chadwick Boseman. And it was just all the more shocking because it was his voice I was hearing in my head. Yeah, of course. As I wrote T'Challa in this story. Um, and I'll never forget that, that sort of whiplash of the joy of finishing the story and then hearing that he had passed away. It really, it's hard to even put into words or help people understand why it had that impact. Well, first was just the excellence of the production. Everyone from Ryan Coogler, um, just everyone, the cast, uh, the costume designer, Ruthie Carter, uh, brought their A game. You know, it was like, as if like, you're only gonna get to do one movie in your lives, what are you gonna do? And, it, and, and they brought that kind of energy into visualizing Wakanda. And, and sharing T'Challa's power with his very powerful Dora Milaje and giving such great roles to those strong women as well. So it just, I, I guess the best way to put it is that when you have felt voiceless, powerless and invisible, as you know, many of us has, have as African-Americans and, and, and people around the globe, you know, especially when you're a minority population, or even if you're a majority population, but you don't get the resources and you don't get the, the respect, um, to see yourselves as powerful with agency, communing with ancestors, flying through the air in hovercraft that are telepathically powered. There's just really no way to express how that fills a void in our imaginations, you know? And even though it's coming from a big corporation and it's IP, you know, and all this kind of thing, we're still able to celebrate it as if it's our, our own. Like we, we made it up, <laughs> we wrote it, we live in Wakanda, we wish we could go to Wakanda, you know? There was a lot of talk about why can't we move to Wakanda? Yeah. So there is this feeling of paradise lost. Yeah. That, that Black Panther really helped fulfill for a lot of us. And for those of us who write other work that isn't in you know, the Marvel universe, it's just, it opens doors. It creates a market where editors don't sort of frown and scratch their heads. When you pitch science fiction, comics, you name it, it's really helped open doors. 
Yeah, amen. I, I think that is very well said. And that's a great note to close out on. Um, so this has been Forbidden Planet TV, where it's been my absolute pleasure to chat with Tanana Reeve Du about her st short story, Return of the Queen, featuring Aurora and Chichala in uh, Black Panther, Tales of Wakanda, the anthology title from Titan Books, which is publishing on March 9th, and which you can order from the links attached to this, this video. Thanks so much for joining us today, Tanana Reeve. Thank you. I had a great time talking to you. Yeah, me too. It was lovely to meet you. Take care. All the very great. best. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.